Media Man Corporation, home of the MC Emax. I'd like to thank you for joining us as we continue along in our presentation series. Today we have our special guest, Mr. Noah Bethel, the Vice President of Product Development. Hello from sunny Tampa, Florida. And I am Todd Gunderson, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing. And uh, we're going to be updating some of our fault zone case studies. And this is our insulation fault zone. So we're going to have Noah along with us and kind of share some of the information that he can deliver to us on insulation fault zone. So Noah, here's some of the problems that we see with the insulation. Excess heat, brittle, moisture, abrasion. Can you speak to any of these? Well, I always like to start with heat. Heat is considered the number one killer of a motor, and it really falls on the insulation as the final fault mode. And so we've got to maintain that heat into, you know, in, uh, according to the motor design. And uh, so, you know, can't say enough about that. That heating, of course, is going to, through expansion and stuff, uh, create issues with embrittlement over time, and we have to pay attention to that as well. So you mentioned the uh, classification of insulation. So you have class A, B, F, and H, which is all controlled through temperature. What happens if you exceed that temperature? Right. So another rule of thumb, uh, which is, you know, pretty well communicated, is that for every 10 degrees above the design temperature, you cut the insulation life in half. Now that's no small deal. So the importance of maintaining that temperature, you know, within the design uh, is critical. So if you have a class F insulation and the temperature of the winding gets above 155 degrees Celsius, you're saying that if it gets 10 degrees above that number, you could potentially reduce the life of your insulation system by 50%? Correct, absolutely. And another rule of thumb for those of you trying to just remember these temperatures, uh, you know, the classification for these, these uh, you know, insulation classes starts at, at class A, which is 105. All you got to do is add 25 degrees for each class, and that tells you the next class. So it steps up 105, 130, 155, and 180. Now, Noah, we look at insulation. This is our standard test. We measure it in megohms. We temperature correct. Why do we do that? So the variabilities that affect temperature or affect insulation resistance are, are really a, a temperature change. And so insulation being a negative temperature coefficient, if you raise the temperature of the insulation, resistance drops. If you lower the temperature of the insulation, resistance goes up. Well, in an, that's a difficult thing to trend when there's so much variability. So the temperature correction allows us to give you a number that's more trendable. So if you test your motor in the winter or you test it in the summer, by having the actual temperature there, you actually can get trendable value. Absolutely. Now, capacitance to ground. This is unique. Not a lot of people show capacitance to ground. Why do we do that? This is a, a huge benefit to the end users in that it gives an earlier indication of a degradation in the insulation. Capacitance to ground is measured through a high-frequency AC signal, which gets through insulation, through contamination, a whole lot easier than DC. So with AC capacitance, you can see the onset of degradation so much earlier and then use the, the, the later indicator of DC resistance to ground as a measure of severity. Now, you were also saying we use capacitance to ground to verify we have good connections. Happens all the time. We see uh, if, you, if, if, if during this test you see an overrange where our capacitance signal is unable to measure a value you, it becomes important to inspect your ground, you know, plane. What, you know, what is the motor grounded to the, to the, to the building bus or to the, sorry, to the ground plane of the, of the facility, um, earth ground, let's say. If you don't have that motor properly grounded uh, through the casing, then it's a fire hazard or a shock hazard to the end user. Now, we trend insulation. That's a great opportunity to look at the actual baseline that we have here, and you can see the value of temperature correcting. Yeah, in fact, you can see measured megohm jumps all over 700, 800, 400, all due to the change in temperature. But the corrected value is, not, is a nice trend downward. And so you can see when we, well, if it's a change from baseline, we always like to look at the baseline first and then a subsequent change if it's 10%, 20%, whatever you set that at. We're going to highlight that in red just so that you can do some further research on it. Now, Noah, we do what's also called a polarization index, where we do a 10-minute test or a 10-minute look at the insulation. We hold a voltage there, whether it's 1,000 volts or up to 5,000 volts, and we take a measurement every one second, and we, we 
display it every five seconds. What's the value of that? This is a hugely popular test in that it gives not just a quantitative value of resistance, but it gives you a profile over time to see what that insulation is doing under charge. Now, this is a healthy polarization index. It's showing a gradual rise in resistance over time as we're polarizing the insulation molecules. And that happens with that DC charge that we apply. So this is what you kind of want to see is that gradual increase in resistance indicating healthy insulation. Now, we also have what's called a polarization index number. And IEEE recommends what for that? Two to five is a recommended uh, PI value. So we take the 10 minute and we divide it by the one minute. Now, what's unique about PDMA and why we show you the profile is just because of this graph here, correct? Yeah, you look at that 10 minute value, probably somewhere up around 4,500 meg, and then you got the 60 second value somewhere down around 1,500, uh, and that's definitely over two. But no one would look at this and determine that that's a healthy insulation system. There is some kind of contamination, moisture, there's something going on discharging this throughout the test, and it needs to be investigated. So even though the number would be within IEEE range of two to five as being good, the actual profile, we would not say that this is, we would observe this for sure. Absolutely. Now, another test that we uh, that we also provide with the MCE version of the MCE Max is a step voltage test. Can you explain this a little bit to us? So a real popular baseline test to get it is this is a sort of a, like a PI where it's a steady voltage over 60 se 600 seconds. This is a step voltage. So they're changing the voltage every minute and determining how the insulation responds through microamp measurements of current. So rather than reporting resistance, we report in microamps of current. Now. The, the beauty of this is it generally is reserved as an overvoltage test. We like it as a baseline to always have for comparison in the future. But in any situation where you're concerned about an insulation, at least one that's under 2300 volts, you can actually safely drive the voltage slightly higher than the line voltage and as a result get indications of trend. Now in this situation, again, every step voltage should have a linear increase in current according to Ohm's law. But in this situation as seen, it's not linear and needs to be investigated. Well, that brings us to the end of this quick insulation fault zone. Um, we always want to thank you for your participation, for being a subscriber. If you like it, go ahead and hit the like button. If you don't, then just don't do anything. Just don't say anything. That's right, right. Yeah, yeah, be quiet about that. <laughs> <laughs> don't let us know. <laughs> Anyways, you can call us at any time. And if you want to look at our website for other case studies or other information that would interest you, please feel free to do so. Until we talk to you again, you, ha you stay safe out there and have a great day.